good evening good afternoon i don't know what time is where but anyway welcome to orinoco tribune's third year anniversary party it is a <coughs> event that will that will discuss the recent electoral debate in different countries in latin america and the occasion is of course that this month of november orinoco tribune has turned 3 years old so 3 years is not a long time but it's not a short time either and the orinoco tribune was uh, founded in november 2018 in caracas venezuela by jesus here and it was to be as the voice of chavistas to the world and to bring <clears throat> real true information from inside venezuela to people around the world from a chavista perspective and it was also to be in english in order to break the language barrier between chavismo and the world and especially to reach people in those countries that are inflicting this blockade against venezuela that we all know is killing people and in addition to that economic blockade there exists also a parallel a similar media blockade against venezuela it's against chavismo it's against the bolivarian revolution and even the venezuelan people in general so this blockade it amplifies a very tiny but well funded the us backed extreme right in venezuela and suppresses the real thoughts and opinions of every venezuelan so orinoco tribune was founded with the aim to give voice to these people who are invisibilized in mainstream media with its vaunted neutrality and independence and what not so despite being founded in venezuela and with the aim of giving information about venezuela also orinoco tribune's approach is not confined to reporting on venezuela only it has a latin american and i should say global dimension because we believe that bolivarianism is not confined to venezuela but is everywhere in the global south and in the whole world in general as the whole of humanity feels a profound connection to commandante chavez's spirit of internationalism and this spirit of internationalism is also a principle of orinoco tribune itself so it is in this spirit that we are holding this event today to celebrate three years of orinoco tribune which and this event will be chaired by orinoco tribune's founder and editor jesus rodriguez espinosa and let's come to today's event of course as we all know this november has been a month of a number of significant electoral processes in many countries in latin america and it is in a very interesting background also like as the us and its allies are increasing harshening the imperialist aggression against what i call a real existing socialism in latin america and with its ever tightening blockades against venezuela against cuba and nicaragua with the passing of the renaissance act the uh, latin american pink tide is also making a comeback in many countries so we consider it important to discuss this situation in the region and today a panel of six journalists activists and political analysts will offer their views in this regard so victoria cervantes will update us on the presidential and general yes. election held in honduras held in honduras only yesterday and ramiro sebastian will speak on the presidential and parliamentary elections held earlier on november 7th in nicaragua antonio wizard will speak about last june's midterm elections in mexico and the upcoming recall referendum in next year and the heated political debate in general in the country and rodrigo venegas will discuss chile's presidential congressional and regional elections held on november 21st and diego sequera will update us on venezuela's regional and municipal elections held on the same november 21 and finally jesus rodriguez espinosa will speak about argentina's parliamentary elections held on november 14th now i will just read out the short biographies of our panelists here today and i start with victoria cervantes so better known as vicky cervantes she became politically active in high school in social justice movement in the 70s she also joined the movements to organize support for national liberation socialism and latin american solidarity in the us she holds degrees in political science 
and in public administration and lives in Chicago, but she is part of the community movements of activists and artists working on community justice issues and anti-imperialism. Fiki is a founding member of La Voz de los Abajo, Chicago, and the coordinator of the Honduras Solidarity Network in North America. Ramiro Sebastian Funes is a Honduran communist and YouTuber and podcaster based in Los Angeles, California. He has directed and produced Nicaragua Against Empire, a documentary series that highlights Nicaragua's resistance to Western imperialism. He is also the host and producer of Unmasking Imperialism, a podcast that exposes imperialist propaganda in mainstream media and popular culture, and I must say, which I enjoy very much. Antonio Huizar is an investigative journalist and political consultant based in Northern Mexico. He studied political science and international relations at the University of Colorado Boulder in the United States, and also holds a degree in public administration from the Ministry of Public Education of Mexico. He has participated as electoral observer and political consultants in Mexican elections. At present, he is a contributor to print and digital media and is an advisor on communications, political strategy, and leadership. Rodrigo Rodsters Venegas is the well known MC of Bronx and Chicago based hip hop duo Rebel Diaz and the founding member of the Rebel Diaz Arts Collective Bronx, which is better known as the RDA CBX, and the host and producer of the web series NEA Don't Stop. He is of Chilean origin and continues to maintain deep ties with his country. Diego Sequeira is a journalist, writer, translator, editor, political analyst, and political advisor based in Caracas, Venezuela. He is a founding member of Mission Verdad, where he currently writes about geopolitics, modern day warfare, global conflict, and Latin American and Venezuelan history and politics. He also founded the Caracas based Samuel Robinson Institute that provides a platform for debate on all sorts of issues in geopolitics and media. He organizes as well as participates in conferences and forums all over Latin America, the Caribbean, and also in Europe and the US. Jesus Rodriguez Espinosa is an expert in international relations, Venezuelan politics, and communication. He served for several years as Venezuela's consul general in Chicago in the United States. And before that, he was part of the founding editorial team of the news website, Aporrea.org. He is the founder and editor of the Venezuelan anti-imperialist website, Orinoco Tribune, that is hosting today's event. So with these words, I would like everyone to welcome to this panel and please enjoy it. And also remember, we are live streaming on Facebook too. So if anyone has questions, well, those who are following on Zoom, please write down your questions in the chat and those who are on Facebook in the comment section in Facebook, I will uh, collect the questions together and put them to the panelists and try to get as many of them as answered as possible. So please, once again, welcome. And Jesus, please take over. Thank you, Sahili. Uh, thank you guys, everyone, especially the panelists, but also the guests of the activity to accept. I mean, I mean, I feel very humbled that you accepted the invitation. I know that we have a nice group of uh, expert specialists in social and electoral issues. And uh, I'm very humbled that you accepted the invitation. Um, I just, uh, before letting you start talking, I just want to inform the, the, the audience that, that the plan is that we're gonna have a, a round of, you know, um, interventions by each of the panelists. It's gonna be a six minute time for each of them. Uh, and then we're gonna have a second round of, um, participations of the panelists uh, uh, and that last second one is going to be a four minute um, speech by each of them and then I, at the end of the event we're going to have a questions and answer sessions and I believe that uh, I, I, we, I invite uh, every one of you to raise your questions to put them in the chat and we're going to try to have them answer uh in the best way possible and also the people in facebook uh we invite you to 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 put the questions in the facebook uh, live stream and we also are going to bring them to the to the chat uh, in zoom and we'll try to answer that all right um hello everyone and 
congratulations to Orinoco Tribune. It's been a great three years. Uh, so I want to talk about Honduras. And I have to say I was up all night uh, and all day and will probably be up most of the time because the election was just yesterday and it's not officially been called yet, but the, uh, the results, the partial formal and official results show very clearly that Ziomara Castro from the uh, Liberty and Refoundation Party and her coalition with other parties that are anti and uh, golpista parties against the coup parties, have won the election. Um, it's, as I said, it's not been officially called yet and all of us who have experience around Honduras are still a little bit on pins and needles because we have seen previous elections stolen even at this point in the electoral process. Uh, but this time it looks like the election is going forward right now. Uh, the returns with over 50% of the votes counted, she has almost a 20 point lead over the National Party, the National Party being the ultra-right neoliberal party of the narco dictatorship, which was established and has been consolidating itself in Honduras since 2009. So this is a, this is a great day in Honduras, the, and this victory belongs to the people who for the last 12 years have been in the streets and have paid for every day of dictatorship with their lives and their tears. So people are partying in the streets in Tegucigalpa, San Pedro Zula, uh, and the smallest towns. But as I said, it's not yet been officially. Uh, the difference this time is that the National Party leadership and the other conservative party, the Liberal Party, have, if not formally conceded, they've conceded that they lost. Uh, also different is it looks like at this point that this time U.S. State Department and U.S. government as they did in 2013 and even more important moment for Honduras and it opens up a space for the social movements and for the people to continue their, their struggle to really create change in Honduras, but it will not be simple. I think it's also significant, There's, I want to say this is a significant thing, because this Honduras is clearly a failed, a totally failed experiment in neoliberal uh, dictatorship in Central America. That the 2009 coup was directly a coup against the idea of rising socialism in Latin America, uh, against the pink tide, against Chavismo, uh, and, and anything related to that. And what has happened in Honduras since then has been the destruction of a country. Uh, its economy, its social fabric, uh, forced out of their country. They now have a poverty rate of over 70%. Uh, so it's, it's significant, this, this change, this victory in the election is significant because it represents the failure of this model. Uh, what remains to be seen, however, is how far the, the new system will be allowed to go. And that's because now what the challenges that Ziomara Castro and her coalition are facing are multiple. Uh, and I think that's something that's going to be discussed more and more uh, as people get down to actually making the change against any maneuvers by the U.S. or the ultra-right. So Ziomara faces a situation of a country that's been basically destroyed. Uh, she faces the fact that the people have 12 years of demands and necessities up and that they are organized and want change. She also faces the fact that she has come into power uh, with a coalition that includes her party, Libre, and inside Libre you have uh, left, very left-wing revolutionaries, and to center-left, democratic socialists, 
Social Democrats. And they're in coalition with, in fact, center and center right forces, the Salvador Nazarala party uh, is the major one, that uh, are against the coup and are against the corruption and the narco dictatorship, but do not have the same program for change, but they're a part of the coalition. And indeed, this time she was able, the leave she was able to build the coalition that even included elements of integrity who deserted their party and supported Ziomara and even a few elements of the rightist national party. So she will be dealing with members of this coalition and their views on of the people and an organized social movement. The other thing that they're going to be dealing with is U.S. imperialism. And while it seems that U.S. imperialism is accepting this election, we know from all the articles and all the discussion that the U.S. is very concerned about Honduras remaining in the U.S. full. There's been article after article in the last two weeks about the risk of the Omar uh, going too close to China. So the China fear and the warmongering against China coming out of the U.S. is being extended to the Honduran situation. We also know that the mining companies, the hydroelectric projects uh, remain on the table for, for U.S. and Canadian companies, and they will not, they will not look kindly at a government uh, implementing programs that are for the needs of the people rather than for the needs of these, these uh, entities and these interests. So on the one hand, it's very exciting. Uh, people are really deserve to celebrate this moment, uh, facing uh, enormous challenges. And I think it's, it's going, and that's just to start off. Uh, there is a debate in, in Honduras over the years over the role of electoral struggle in politics that perhaps we'll, there'll be more discussion later in the panel. But I do wanna say that the, for right now in Honduras, people are just celebrating. The, the movement is celebrating and they're looking towards how to protect this victory and how to actually develop change. When they know, in fact, they only have a certain number of another election. So <laughs> they, they, it's now, and I, I hope we can, uh, if people have questions, um, I look forward to answering them. Thank you. Something. I think I should now give the floor or the word to Antonio Wizard. Please tell us about whatever you wish to say on Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really humbled to be speaking with you all today. I'm sure we'll have a very productive conversation. I'll start off with talking about the uh, last elections in June, which were midterms, and they came at right at the middle of the administration of the new leftist president who was elected in 2018. They were the largest elections in history. We had over 21,000 concurrent races. And uh, most of them were won by the ruling party, which is the Movement for National Regeneration. This is the left of center uh, party that the uh, president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, emanates from. And uh, of these, in, in these elections, the, the lower house was um, up for grabs. All 500 seats were up for grabs and also 15 of 32 governorships. And so the ruling leftist party won 11 of these 15 governorships and also retained its simple majority in the lower house. So it looks like uh, the president will be uh, strengthened to push forward a leftist agenda in the latter half of his administration. And the, the opposition uh, coalesced around uh, the a coalition that agglomerated the three main opposition parties. And in this coalition, you can see a bit of desperation uh, by these uh, right-wing actors, which uh, will be interesting going forward to the recall referendum of 2022, which I'll touch on later. Uh, precisely this past weekend, we were recollecting uh, signatures in order to activate this electoral mechanism. We need 
of all elig eligible voters in Mexico to sign on uh, to a petition in order to activate the recall referendum. And it's called the recall referendum, but the point, the, this uh, referendum is promoted by the president himself. He is going to submit himself to this uh, referendum to running the risk of being recalled, but he still retains a very high popularity. And so that's a very low possibility that he'll lose this election. And so it's a very smart, in fact, political move in order to strengthen the mandate of a leftist administration, which has seen its hands tied quite a bit uh, for the first three years of this mandate. And so on, in that sense, it's a political move to strengthen and push forward probably a more, if not aggressive, more fortright leftist agenda to finalize his government. But secondly, it's also putting into play an electoral mechanism to deepen um, participatory democracy here in Mexico and enabling an electoral mechanism that can benefit Mexicans in the future in, in the case that they have a bad government that they wish to recall. Um, touching on the subject of the pink tide versus the Monroe Doctrine, um, this is very interesting, specifically coming from Mexico, because Mexico doesn't fit neatly into this narrative of the pink tide. Uh, Mexico has had right-wing governments successively since 1940 until 2018, when this was broken by the election of Andrés Manuel López Obrador and the movement for national regeneration. And so in this sense, Mexico doesn't fit neatly into this narrative of the pink tide. And as a U.S. trained political scientist, I'd also like to add that the pink tide itself is a term coined by U.S. academia that um, I know it raises suspicion, at least on my part, on the explicatory um, nature of, the, of this term. And then touching on the Monroe Doctrine, also Mexico doesn't fit quite neatly, or I would say the rest of Latin America, the, the term doesn't reflect the current historical conditions of Latin America, precisely because the Monroe Doctrine was sort of a warning, right, to European powers that they shouldn't meddle in Latin American affairs, lest the U.S. interfere. But, I mean, we need only to look at um, the seizure of Venezuelan gold reserves in, in the Bank of England to see that the European powers are effectively intervening in Latin America. And so as as an explicatory tool, I don't believe the Monroe Doctrine holds um, much merit. And also, we're discussing in Mexico this uh, electricity reform. And this electricity reform is effectively a de facto nationalization of the electric industry here in Mexico. And it's probably one of the policy decisions that uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador seeks to push forward when they strengthen from a strengthened position after the recall referendum that he's probably going to win. Um, and in this electric, uh, electric electricity reform, you can see the hands of foreign companies, specifically Spanish foreign owned companies. And so you can see there also the interference of European powers that doesn't quite reflect, you know, the Monroe Doctrine in which European powers are hands off from Latin America and, um, and the US is as well hands off from Europe. Um, I think the electoral outcome in 2022 is going to be particularly interesting because it might cement the foundations for the presidential succession of 2024. And that's where we might see whether the leftist project in Mexico is going to survive for another six years as we have six, uh, six year terms here in Mexico, or whether it could be stunted by a galvanized opposition, which day by day uh, sees itself in a more desperate position. And we can see these, this in the last elections in which they coalesced around a three-party coalition and they committed a lot of mistakes and they did not win. They only won four of the 15 governorships. They reduced their numbers of deputies. And it seems that uh, the president, even in the northern state, like the state that I'm in, um, which is a very conservative state right on the U.S. border, we can see here that even the president has very high approval ratings uh, that might, 
you know, play into not only the RICO referendum, but going forward into 2024? Okay, as uh, thank you for mm, the presentation. And now I would ask Ramiro to talk about the elections in Nicaragua and in general on Nicaragua. Thank you. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me on. My name is Ramiro Sebastian Funes. I'm a Honduran communist content creator based in LA. And I'm also celebrating the victory of. Presidenta Xiomara Castro de Celaya in Honduras and the Partido Libre. I'm very excited and happy to see my native country of Honduras move in a positive direction to join the Latin American wave of resistance, of revolution against Yankee imperialism. And before talking about Nicaragua and Latin America in general, I want to start off by reading a quote from. Comandante Ernesto Che Guevara from 1964 that I think is very relevant today. So he says, quote, this epic before us is going to be written by the hungry indigenous masses, the peasants without land, the exploited workers. It is going to be written by the progressive masses, the honest and brilliant intellectuals who so greatly abound in our suffering Latin American lands struggles of masses and ideas, an epic that will be carried forward by our peoples, mistreated and scorned by imperialism, our people unreckoned with until today, who are now beginning to shake off their slumber. Imperialism considered us a weak and submissive flock, and now it begins to be terrified of that flock, a gigantic flock of 200 million Latin Americans in whom Yankee monopoly capitalism now sees its grave diggers. So that was Comandante Ernesto Che Guevara in 1964. And I believe this quote is very applicable, applicable today. One thing that Karl Marx, the great communist revolutionary talks about in dialectical materialism is the negation of the negation. The idea that throughout history in these dialectical processes of revolution, we'll have an advance and then we'll have a retreat and then we'll have another advance even more. Lenin liked to refer to it as two steps forward, one step back or one step back, two steps forward. And this is the cycle of historical materialism of revolution, not just in Latin America and in the world. And I believe that today we are making history and witnessing the advance forward, the new red wave of Latin American socialism, now that Xiomara Castro de Celaya has been elected as the first woman president of Honduras in a country that has one of the highest femicide rates in the world, in a country that has been dominated by US imperialism, and also the victory of the Sandinista Front in Nicaragua, a revolutionary government led by Comandante Daniel Ortega and Compañera Rosario Murillo, who are working hand in hand with other progressive revolutionary governments in the region, Venezuela, President Nicolás Maduro, with Cuba, President uh, Miguel Díaz Canel, with the People's Republic of China, with Iran, with Russia, and so many other nations around the world that are building socialism. And Nicaragua is an important part of that growing axis of resistance to international imperialism. And it's a wave that looks different from what it did in the 20th century. It has a different class character, it has a different face, maybe the, the branding and the ideology is different, but it still fundamentally is resisting the primary contradiction, the primary enemy of humanity, Wall Street, London, capitalism, imperialism, this global neo-settler colonial system that dominates all peoples around the world. And in Nicaragua, a very small country in the central, the center of Central America, the people have elected to continue their revolution. Elections were held in Nicaragua in November, on the first week of November. 
and the Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional, the Sandinista National Liberation Front, had a tremendous victory. Comandante Ortega won with 75.8% of votes. His victory was so astounding that I can't point to a single person today who can even tell me the name of the, of the person that he ran against. His name is Walter Espinosa, a right-winger with the PLC party. Nobody even knew who he was. He was irrelevant. The opposition in Nicaragua is irrelevant because their program of neoliberalism, of capitalism, of the free market, the invisible hand, nobody believes in that because the people of Nicaragua know what neoliberalism is. They experienced it for 16 years between 1990 and 2006 during the neoliberal era of Nicaragua where all of the progressive gains of the first era of the Sandinista revolution from 1979 to 1989, land reform, women's rights, indigenous, Afro-indigenous rights, workers' rights, campesino rights, all of those advancements were rolled back for 16 years under the neoliberal era from 1990 to 2006. 2007, Daniel Ortega comes back as president after the election in 2006. And since then, the government of Nicaragua has been building socialism on the basis of unity and reconciliation, which is one of the slogans of Nicaragua today, which means that they no longer hold grudges against people who in the 70s or 80s might have been against the Sandinista government. I actually recently published a video about a few days ago of a former commander of the counter-revolutionaries, the Contras, who once was at the head of murdering Sandinistas, was on the battlefield, head-to-head -head combat with the Sandinistas, and now is one of the most fiercest campaigners for the FSLN, for the Sandinistas. And she openly admits that she was duped by the imperialists, she was controlled, and she regrets her decision. And seeing the advancements of socialism, of Sandinismo, she has changed her position and now campaigns for the Frente Sandinista. So stories like that, there's so many of them in Nicaragua. And also during the election as well, aside from President Daniel Ortega winning over 75% of the vote, the National Assembly of Nicaragua overwhelmingly uh, in favor of the Sandinista. The Sandinistas have 75 seats out of a total of 91, which is uh, around 73% constituency. Tremendous win, and this means that the Sandinista revolution will continue to advance in the second phase, will continue to bring a lot of prosperity, development, peace for the people of Nicaragua, which is something that I have personally been able to see myself. I was in Nicaragua twice this year, uh, once in March and again in July for the anniversary of the Sandinista revolution. I was conducting interviews. I, I produced a documentary called Nicaragua Against Empire, where I interviewed multi-generational supporters of the Sandinista revolution to get their sense of why they support their government. And it's a very beautiful thing to see because up until yesterday, you had these two completely parallel universes, Honduras and Nicaragua. My family's from Honduras. And when we compare Honduras and Nicaragua, even though culturally, historically, even linguistically are so similar, brother nations. It's like saying they're so small, the countries, it's like saying the distance between North Carolina and South Carolina, about the same size, about the same distance. But because Nicaragua has been able to build socialism, they've achieved so much more than what has happened in Honduras. For example, in 2020, during hurricanes Eta and Iota that struck both nations, in Nicaragua, I visited the area in the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua called Bilui, where a category four and a category five hurricane struck. No one died. The government was mobilized. The troops were mobilized to immediately evacuate people. They immediately took people to safe areas where they would not be struck by the hurricane. Meanwhile, in Honduras, in the Caribbean coastline, hundreds and thousands of people died from those hurricanes. So much damage has been done. And after the hurricanes in Nicaragua, the Sandinista government mobilized the national sectors of society to rebuild those areas. I was there just a few months after the hurricane struck in November. I went in March and 
already they were almost done with reconstruction efforts. Meanwhile, in Honduras, in places like Tocoa, La Ceiba, Gracias a Dios, those areas are still completely destroyed by the hurricane. And that's because in Honduras, under neoliberalism, you have profits in command. You have capitalism in command. In Nicaragua, following the slogan of socialism, solidarity, Christianity, and brotherhood, people are put first, not profits. And in Nicaragua, so many accomplishments have been made. And this is why the election was so clearly in favor of Comandante Daniel Ortega Saavedra. And it's interesting because in the lead up to the election, not only was Nicaragua sanctioned, right? We have the Renacer Act, which was imposed by the U.S. Congress a few days before the election even happened. So the U.S. was already saying, oh, the elections are illegitimate, they're not democratic before they even happened. So it made no difference whatsoever. Also, the Nica Act, which are another act of sanctions designed to destabilize the Nicaraguan economy. Despite that, Nicaragua has been able to have tremendous GDP growth, one of the fastest growing economies in Central America, and has been alleviating poverty all over the country, in the countryside, in the urban areas. And the Sandinista revolution has also been advancing political rights. Today, Nicaragua is among the top 10 countries with the most gender parity between men and women. In the Sandinista government, they have a system called la trenza or the braid. If we look at someone's braided hair, for example, you see one line going like this, another going like that, another like this, another like that. That means that in every major institution, it has to be woman, man, woman, man, woman, man. And not because they're just trying to fill a quota, not because they're trying to be quote unquote woke or politically correct or anything like that, but it's because the Sandinista revolution is fundamentally led by and for working class women, proletarian feminism, both in the countryside and in the urban areas. And women, indigenous women, Afro indigenous women, and working class women are the leaders, the vanguard of the Sandinista revolution. And it's a beautiful experience to be able to see that firsthand. Nicaragua, unfortunately, within even within the left, I would say, has not gotten the solidarity and respect that it deserves because of so much demonization, so much slandering. People remember the original Sandinista Revolution, 1979, 1980, and then they left. They abandoned Nicaragua. But so much has been done after that and since then. And I think it's important. I compel people to go to Nicaragua and see for yourself the advancements made by the Sandinista government and it is a model for peoples around the world, oppressed peoples around the world who want to build an alternative. And I think another crucial component of that, the success of the Sandinista revolution is food sovereignty. Over 90% of the food that Nicaraguans consume is produced not only domestically within the country, but within a 10 mile radius of where you're eating that plate of food. That means that the people of Nicaragua are not dependent on Coca-Cola, on Nestle, on Burger King, on McDonald's, on Pizza Hut for their nourishment, for their food. They have land redistribution programs where Sandinista campesinos are directly providing food to the people and are nourishing the people. And that is so central to the Sandinista revolution. And it has allowed for Nicaragua to survive despite any and all sanctions, because no matter what, they're feeding their people, they're nourishing their people. And this is so central to the Nicaraguan revolution. So overall, just to wrap up here, the Sandinista revolution continues. President Daniel Ortega was reelected overwhelmingly with over 75% of votes. The Sandinista front has the majority, overwhelming majority of seats in the National Assembly. And this is, again, there's over 10 parties in Nicaragua. There's more. There's over a dozen parties in Nicaragua. Everyone is freely allowed to participate. And this goes to show you that when we stick to the ideas of what socialism is really about, peace, stability, progress, lifting people out of poverty, dignity, national dignity, these 
ideas are ultimately victorious. These are these ideas, no matter what, are always going to win. And Nicaragua is a great example of that. And I hope, for me as a Honduran, I hope that with Presidenta Xiomara Castro Celaya, I hope Honduras will also follow in a similar path. And I hope that now that we have Nicaragua and Honduras and Venezuela and Cuba and, and Peru and, and so many other nations, that we can revive the vision of Simón Bolívar, of Francisco Morazán, of Tupac Amaru, of Sandino, of Jose Carlos Mariategui, of a united socialist Latin America. Thank you. Thank you, Ramiro. I apologize for the audio problems, but those things happen. I'm back. And now is the time for Diego to um, talk a little bit about Venezuela. Go ahead, Diego. Thank you, Jesus. And hey, to here. Uh, yeah, I was making sure that I was actually, uh, the mic was on. <laughs> okay. So, well, first of all, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, all the crew at Orinoco Tribune for this. I'm also very happy to be here and also celebrate this three years. And also, I, before I start, I also want to add something and celebrate uh, Honduras' last electoral victory. It's like going full circle for, from a nightmare that started in 2009 and actually was pretty shocking back then and when, when the region, in a way, deceptively perhaps, was seen as not so vulnerable at this kind of coup. And um, I mean, if you remember, even there was some sort of influence or control over the OAS and we wasn't even able to, you know, to roll back the coup. So it was pretty striking to see how empire was coming back after so many, I don't know, so many wins, I guess. Anyway, so it's very good news and it's happy. And well, there's a lot to look forward to there, but it's nevertheless, it's highly important and significant. So it's, above all, I think it's one of the most important electoral developments of all we could come in here right now without, you know, uh, ruling out the value of any of the, of the other ones. Anyway, so my turn is about Venezuela and the recent elections last week, uh, the week before last week. And um, first of all, I think for what, for what the country has been gone through, it's very, you got a, a 42% something of people that participated in these elections, which is like, I don't know, 8 million something. I think it was the official figures of, of the scenario. I'll check them out in a minute, which is, I don't know, it's pretty important after so many, and after so many attempts, regardless of what all, all we can, go through of all these years, uh, so many attempts to depoliticize the Venezuelan landscape during all these years and how that actually, I think it, it failed again. I mean, because not only because of, of a number that you, uh, under these terms are actually quite extraordinary, but also because of the political participation of other uh, opposition forces. I mean, and also to show one more time that we can have normal, even boring elections. Uh, this one being one of those cases because it wasn't actually too dramatic. And that also could suggest some exp explanations. We're still analyzing, we're still going through what happened and what, what, everything, what else you can assess about all these. But there are some like at least like six points I wrote down that could be important to look at. Uh, from now on, some sort of political benchmark also, because we can say in some way or another that at least at some extent, we also overcame some cycle uh, of disruption and violence that before this, it was quite aggressive. And now it was, I mean, so many territory was reconquered. And I mean, in general terms for the country that to be able to engage politically and try to show a different map of uh, the actual Venezuelan political reality. So in a way, Chavismo, the Chavista vote behaved quite predictably, I think. I mean, it's still not 
too low of its usual to hardcore, hardcore base. It was around 3 million something, close to 4 million, which is still quite important after all what we, we were supposed to know or what they tell us about uh, what, people, what Chavismo means in this country. Also, so, I mean, there are surprises, but I think the many, most meaningful ones in this case, in this battle for norm normalcy in Venezuela was actually came from the opposition or even in this sense, what Chavismo lost in this opportunity because, uh, well, it tells a very different story about the success of some other opposition narratives that have been trying to, you know, being established traumatically uh, against the population because actually one of the main uh, takeaways is that, well, the other failure of Guaido as a, and his faction, which is actually exists with the anti-political uh, pro-disruption faction that actually, well, I mean, didn't have a say, didn't have a, 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 an important influence in this, in the outcome of this, of this, elections and also the from one side the reappearance of old figures from Venezuelan politics I mean fourth republic uh, before Chavismo politicians seasoned one veteran ones uh, on one side on the other re, uh, ways different ways of setting of, of reconfiguration of, of what's left of the other uh, of the other faction of the opposition that we could split also in at least in, in electoral terms in three of them we had uh, La Plataforma Unitaria, which was the former, former, former mood card for the unity, which actually brings to the fold some of the, some of the, what do you call it, the, the G4 parties, as in the, the, the mainstream opposition parties that engage directly and enthusiastically in each and every one of the destructive misadventures that Venezuela has gone through since the start of this in 2013, after the Comandante's death. Uh, bear in mind that these were, I mean, we're talking about uh, thousands, 3,082 uh, positions to be elected and, and a huge number also of, of candidates, not only in 24 governorships, but also in 335 municipalities and also in some of the municipal councils and according to to the state that they developed. So under that framework, I mean, the Plataforma Unitaria, for example, was able to reconquer two states, Sulia, which was not so surprising uh, given what everybody expected and what was, and was assessed about Chavista, Chavista uh, in general terms, Chavista's uh, management of the state in recent years. And also, uh, Cojedes, for example, which was also reconquered in this case, which was the most impressive of all because historically it wasn't a Chavista state, it was reconquered by the Acción Democrática Party and also Nueva Esparta, which is also quite predictable given some considerations. But the fact is that we're, that we're not talking about a, a homogeneous victory that also tells about other things that we should also bear in mind. For example, the uh, the whole split of, of, of all these internal parties and the, and the way they reassessed themselves and they reinserted themselves in politics also explains that something different is moving. Uh, this time uh, against, yeah, the mobilization of the, of the Chavista factor that once again showed how efficiently it, had, it could be given an election. And given the election of this kind and given the lack of, or the drive against politicization in Venezuela. They, some people tried to say there's been a lot of spins about the possibility if the opposition was unified, uh, they could have gone, uh, got an even higher number of governorships or municipalities. But first of all, that didn't happen. But also that has, has happened for a reason. This is something we should think about. These fractions, these fractures of the general opposition also tells about a different process going on, a different moment in, in, in what it could be a, based on survival, but anyway, a moment that some politicians actually rather engage in this than you got committing themselves one more time, at least for now. Sure, sure. I will, I will wrap it up before that. That, um, that in this case, uh,
come they or they make a comeback or they or they remained in the political framework outside uh, inside of uh, against violence in itself this also sets part of the battle for normalcy in venezuela i think it also has to do with that it also by the way it also brings another fourth opposition here because there's another major a major debate between the communist party and what they should be and how the younger generations are now fair against the current leadership and how they want to address themselves as opposition, which also I think it's a healthy element. But the, another point before finishing that I think is also very important to take into consideration is the foreign participation in this case, especially the EU foreign participation, and also the lack of reactions, the, the, the lack of uh, conflict with other factions. And I think also you have to not be so optimistic about it because you also could think that this also was a trial balloon election to further engagements in the future according to what this kind of uh, situation of dynamic was set after the elections because this show different reactions different phenomenon that going that goes on uh, inside chavismo and also inside the opposition nevertheless uh, you can also conclude that Venezuela has hold of the line. First, the Chavista government, the Chavista movement as an electoral, as an electoral movement, and also committed at several layers of society, uh, have prevailed uh, in a very important way. But that should be unfair to say it wasn't exclusive of Chavismo. I think that also another takeaway that's very important how some other people, tired of, of the, 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 the recent experiences, also decided to participate, regardless of, of how short-sighted could one of, the, of, of their interests could be in some cases or another, how genuine this could be, on the normalization of the country that also goes in line with the, with the other attempts that in a way are starting to say photo voce, sotto voce that sanctions aren't actually working as well as, they, as, the, as the, late, the latest review by the, the Treasury Department uh, a few weeks ago about how successful and how infallible san the, a, a sanctions regime could be against a targeted country. I think that's also important. And this also happens in a context that in the region, we're basically on some sort of like Granchi would call it an unstable balance, which also has a lot to say. We have to see what the, the, the next developments would be to also get a better picture, I think, of all of, of the of the big picture of the region and the hemisphere up, up to this point. Anyway, I'll leave the rest for the rest for behind. So yes. thank you very much. Yes. Sorry for interrupting you. No problem, man. Uh, but you're gonna have we're gonna have a chance in the second round. Uh, I will sure. ask Rodrigo to move on and to let us know about his impression on Chile's elections, which are very interesting also. Okay, cool. Um, just, I, I'm going to do a real quick, just to keep, keep, catch people up, because, you know, for those who aren't necessarily 100% up on uh, on what's been going on in Chile. So, October uh, 18th, 2019, the students, the high school students, uh, rebel against a 30 cent raise in the transport, um, and it becomes uh, a national movement when those high school students are severely brutalized by the Pacos in Chile, as the, the Chilean police are called. Um, and these images spread across the nation. And, you know, next thing you know, there is una revuelta social, a social uprising in Chile that would probably still be going on if it hadn't been stopped uh, by the COVID pandemic. And so, what we have in Chile is a victory in the sense of a social uprising that literally had neoliberal uh, Sebastián Piñera uh, on the ropes. Um, to give an update, when we talk about neoliberalism, Chile is where the experiment for, for neoliberalism uh, happened, you know, with uh, neoliberal economists like Milton Friedman and the Chicago Boys history, Chile was ground zero for neoliberalism in the sense that it literally was the, 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 the land that they practiced it on. And so when you look at the Chile experience 48 years after the dictatorship of 1973, you can't look at it without acknowledging that there's 30 years of a supposed democracy, right, of a concertación that really hasn't allowed people in Chile to live a life of dignity. And so these are these uprisings in October 18th of 2019 
are also a rejection of not only the neoliberal model, but also of a failure of uh, parties of the left to also really, uh, you know, give access to a life of dignity. And so we're clear that it was 30 years of of a neoliberal model that they're rejecting. And so the rallying cry became, it's not 30 cents, no son 30 pesos, son 30 años. It's not 30 cents, it's 30 years. Um, this rebellion, very much after a month, had the whole country on fire from the south to the north, uh, whether it was in Concepcion, whether it was in Antofagasta, in Iquique, it wasn't just the capital city where there was people uh, resisting in the streets. And so a key date that happens, which I think is very key to talk about in this context of this election, is a peace treaty that happens on November 15th of 2019. This peace treaty uh, eventually is what was seen as a partial victory in that it led to the referendum vote on whether Chilenos were going to be able to write a new constitution, right? Uh, yet at the same time, uh, by folks that were on the ground resisting and fighting, it was also seen as a backstabbing by some of these leftist parties that sat down and gave legitimacy to the Piñera government. And many see this peace treaty that doesn't give freedom to the, to the political prisoners of today, that doesn't, in any sense, give legitimacy to this resistance, um, kind of a peace treaty that leads uh, to the pacification of the rebellion. Okay, and, and I want to say this because one of the main actors in this peace treaty is the leftist candidate, who's today's the candidate, who is uh, Gabriel Boric, okay? And so I share this because this is very much going to come into play when it comes to this election. What are Chilenos facing with? Uh, after this November 5th, uh, 15th peace treaty, there was a vote in April in which Chilenos voted in a landslide victory. 72% of the nation voted that they wanted to write a new constitution through a constitutional convention that would elect normal people from, from communities, uh, whether it was, you know, basically different folks to come and write a new constitution. Why was a new constitution needed? Because even though the dictatorship ended in 1989 of Pinochet, the, the constitution of Pinochet is still living in Chile today, okay? And so that's why this rejection of this Pinochet era constitution um, is a victory, but at, like I said, at the same time, it came at the cost of pacifying a rebellion that perhaps was going for more. Um, with this move, Gabriel Boric positions himself as uh, more of a mainstream candidate to, to what the Communist Party's Daniel Hadwe was. The election goes down, and with the coalition of the Apruevo, Apruevo Dignidad, and it's key that we use this because when he talks about Apruevo, it was Apruevo for the Constitution, Dignidad being the fight. The ground zero for the fight was called Plaza Dignidad. There was a plaza that before was called Plaza Italia, then Plaza Baquedano after colonizers. The people resisted and chose to call it Plaza Dignidad. So in many ways, you also see how some of these uh, more, I guess, central leftist movements take from the rebelliousness of the streets and kind of make it a little bit more towards their agenda. Um, so the victory that, 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 that this uh, constitution led um, in many ways uh, had a shortcoming in this latest election of November 21st. That election uh, pretty much came out that the two leaders uh, are the Aprevo Dignidad Coalition, which is with young Gabriel Boric, one of the former leaders of the student movement. Um, and then you have the, the far right wing fascist uh, Frente Social Cristiano, which is led by Jose Antonio Cast, who is uh, you know, pretty much like a young Trump a young Bolsonaro, a populist, um, you know, leader in a sense, who surprisingly got 27.91, the largest percentage of votes went to the far right wing. Now, most people that are looking at this from far would say, wait a minute, how does this happen? There's a social uprising. We just had a new constitution, you know? And in many ways, um, I would like to make a comparison you know, I think that what's going on in many countries in Latin America, I like to call copy and paste imperialism, right? And so for someone who's been on social movements on the ground in the U.S., I said, wait a minute, I've lived this before. I feel as a person that I've lived this exact scenario before. In 2015, when there was a social uprising 
similar to the social uprising in Chile in the sense that it lasted long and the national impact that it had, the Ferguson Rebellion, okay, of Mike Brown, in which many of us said, wow, this is the first time I've experienced uh, black and brown folks on the ground resisting uh, a military occupation. Well, that rebellion led to a victory for Donald Trump because the media, you know, we're clear, takes a role in criminalizing. And so people, part of the populist, you know, uh, road to victory is working with this media concept of people's fear. You know what I mean? And so what do they go on? They, they, they tap into people's fear. In Chile, there's two main things going on, right? There's an immigration rise that's been larger than ever before. Uh, uh, Haitian, Colombian, uh, Venezuelan, you know, even though the Venezuelans, Venezuel, the facho Venezuelans are received with, with open arms by the, the Piñera government, but you have a Colombian, an Ecuadorian, a Dominican, a large Chile is like the U.S. of South America when it comes to immigrant migrants going and looking for work. Okay, and so Cast, like Trump, right, is running on an anti-immigrant uh, uh, campaign, an obsession with law and order, right? Tapping into the fears of everyday Chileans who are seeing the, the criminalization of the uprisings going on. Very much how it happened here in the US when Trump won off of a wave of fear of, of the blue line and the folks talking about Black Lives Matter. And so I say this comparison and that I think that in many ways what we're seeing in Chile is similar to, to, to the Trump, um, you know what I mean, uh, victory in the US. At the same time, I also see, I'm not sure if we're in Chile right now, what I'm living is 2015 or 20, uh, 2020, because at the same time, you're also seeing the large left-wing coalitions that are saying, that's it, we have to blindly support Bordix because he represents the lesser evil, right? He doesn't represent the fascism of caste. And so everybody is going against uh, cast and so you see this left wing coalition coming together, um, and so it's it, it's a tough moment because if folks don't come together, there's a high possibility that Jose Antonio Cast may win, and what would that mean for the Mapuche community? Um, you know, for the Mapuche community, you know, severe severe uh, repercussions. At the same time, I also have fears. Some of my fears are that we're going to be electing another Biden. You know what I mean? In which we're not really following the people that are fighting on the streets, but we're electing the lesser evil, more central, you know, government who at the same time are the same. We would not be in this moment politically if it wasn't for the rebellion. And Bordix doesn't really represent the rebellion, the politics and the ideas of the rebellion. Uh, I know I have, to, I have to hurry up and finish. What I do feel is this. In Chile, what we cannot take away is that the uprising of the last two years has politicized young people to the level that the, the level of voting is higher than ever before. You're not going to easily get rid of the feminist organizations, you know, that started in Chile. The young Primera Linea, the people that fought front line and, and, and shared tactics with Primera Linea in Colombia and Primera Linea, you know what I mean, in, in, in different countries that are also uh, have been resisting. At the same time, I also think that what we're experiencing overall in Latin America is a large disconnect with young folks because we, we're not owning that there's been failures. There's been legitimate failures of some of the revolutionary, you know, I would say more leftist governments. And so I think that it's important that we also see that with what that's going on in Chile is, is, is also because there's been failures on the, on, on the central left. And so I think that overall, the result has been that it's a victory that we're going to have a new conventional constitution. It's a victory that you can't take away. But at the same time, we're also seeing a rise in fascism. And fascism is going to rise, whether this, whether cost wins or loses, you're still going to be dealing with a sector of Chilean society that is anti-Black, anti-immigrant, anti-woman, and very much uh, the white supremacy of the United States being mirrored in even the racial structure of, of the Chilean elite. And so I think that what neoliberalism, where it started, it's not going to end easily. It's not going to be a battle that's easily going to be given away. I think also when you talk about neoliberalism and capitalism, you have to assume that Boric is a neoliberal. And so... Capitalism right now, in many ways, on a global level, um, 
maybe wants to be a little bit more inclusive and wants to be a little bit safer and wants to say Black Lives Matter and wants to say we're ecologically, you know what I mean? And we have to also have our eyes open for this form of more safer capitalism because they are the enemy as well. So my main question, I think, when it comes to elections is who are the enemies of neoliberalism? And if they're not enemies of neoliberalism, then they're not really allies to the people on a long run extent. I still think people should vote for Boric. They should, they should win. Um, you know, uh, but, but as Rebel Diaz, as, as the work that we do, I'm always going to be with the frontline homies that at the end of the day know are clear that Boric to know uh, or cast the conditions in their community ain't going to be that different the same way in the Bronx when Biden won aren't that different either. And so I think that we have to, uh, moving forward, keep an eye on Chile because uh, the, the, the ground zero of neoliberalism is there. And at the same time, we have to keep an eye open for these uh, changes because capitalism is like water sometimes. It tries to be fluid and it, and, and, and it tries to fit in to whatever it fits into to keep surviving. And if they're uh, you know, needed to get rid of, of fascism, they'll do it. And so basically that's, that's kind of my, my analysis on it. I think that we need to keep an eye on what's Thank going you. on. Uh, and that's it. Peace, my bad if I went on too long. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, we need to move on. Um, uh, it's now my turn. I, I, I'm going to show you, I'm going to share with you a slideshow that I, that I have. Uh, let me, give me one second. It's basically, I mean, it's basically this slideshow that I'm going to present here. Hold on a second. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the elections and do you hear me okay? Please let me know if my if that my that my do you see the, the slideshow now? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna present you the the information here. If you don't hear me, let me know, please, because I know that I'm having problem with the audio. But uh, what I wanted to show you here is that um, some basic information about Argentina. I mean, Argentina uh, has this uh, uh, half-term parliamentary elections a couple of weeks ago. And uh, for Argentina have a population of 40, 000, 40 million, uh, almost 46 million people. The electoral roll is 30, almost uh, 34 million people. And the turnout for that last election, parliamentary one was 71%, so almost 72%. And, uh, and I have to tell you that voting in, in Argentina is mandatory. So that's why you have, uh, and, they, and they try to enforce this very hard. And uh, there were 127 deputies deputies uh, in dispute in that election, which means half of the deputy chamber. And they had also 24 senators, uh, which means one third of the of the of the Senate that were uh, the charges that were being disputed. Then, in the election Juntos por el Cambio, which is the the, the coalition of, of you know parties that uh, uh, are close to Macri. And to the right wingers, uh, uh, almost reached 10 million votes. But also Frente de Todos, which is the party of Cristina Fernandez and Alberto Fernandez, the president and vice president, uh, almost got 8 million votes. And then you have like three parties, Avanzada Libertad, Hacemos por Córdoba, and Frente de Izquierda, which uh, if you add all of them together, they, they, they made a total of like... 4,200,000 votes, which is something important and, and something to take into consideration for the, for the electoral results. But before uh, going into the results themselves, I believe that it's important to highlight that, uh, uh, you know, in the middle of the parliamentary elections debate, I mean, Argentina uh, has been passing through very complicated moments, especially the one related to the foreign debt crisis and all these negotiations that, that they have been trying to do with the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and, and, and that is important because the Macri administration had uh, uh, in debt itself like uh, in uh, more than $40 billion. 
So, so, so that's terrible. And, and then they, they, they are also handling the COVID-19 pandemic, which was a problem. And that of course have an impact uh, and created this economic crisis that is affecting a lot of uh, Argentinians. And at the end, there is this friction between Cristina Fernandez and Alberto Fernandez that uh, came to the light uh, more publicly, at least after the PASO elections, which were the um, primaries that were her held before the parliamentary elections. So here you have the, the, the results of the, of the election. And there you can see that in the left, we have how was the deputy, the deputy chamber uh, before the election to the left. And to the right, you can see how it got after. So as you can see, the, the party Frente de Todos, which is the, the government party, uh, only lost uh, two seats in the, in the deputy chamber. But uh, the, the Juntos por el Cambio, the right-wing coalition, got it, uh, got it uh, more, more, more seats, I mean. But anyway, what I wanted to show you with this slide is that the, is that the, the, the Peronistas, the Justicialistas, the, 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 the people following Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Fernandez are the most important majority in the deputy chamber. Uh, and that basically, I mean, you cannot, you don't see a big change there, but of course they are gonna be forced to find a, 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 a alliances with, a, with, a, with, the, with other minor political parties. And now here in this slide, you can see how the, how the Senate, uh, uh, I mean, result uh, is being shown. And in this case, uh, we, we, can, we have to say that the Frente de Todos lost the majority that they hold since uh, the dictatorship end in, 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 in Argentina. I believe that it, uh, we're talking about since uh, 1984 or 87, uh, the Frente de Todos, the the, the Justicialistas had a majority of the Senate, and for the first time in, in several decades, they lost uh, the control over the, over the Senate, but also there is no majority in the Senate. So a Frente de Todos remains the most important force within the Senate. Uh, so, so and, and many analysts believe that, that, that this is going to, you know, represent. A, I mean, it's not going to be a big, a, a big of a problem because uh, the. I mean, Cristina Fernandez is the head of the Senate, and everyone says that she is like the, the head of. The, I mean, she's very wise in terms of, uh, in terms of. Uh, negotiations within the Congress. So uh, anyway, I, I just wanted to show you the numbers. I wanted to show you the context in which the elections were held. And what is everyone says is that uh, what is coming is that the, the, the Frente de Todos is going to try to find alliances with the smallest parties in, 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 that are in the Congress and in the Senate in order to move on with the agendas that they want to run, which is basically right now one of the most important issues that they have in, in, in Argentina is the, is the issue of um, having a common front and an agreement within the Congress to move on with the negotiation with the IMF, which is a very complex issue that they are facing in Argentina. So uh, I, I'm gonna leave it uh, until this because uh, we're running out of time. I'm gonna invite every one of you to, to do like a small, you know, closing up. We were talking about four minutes of, you know, uh, in the second round, but we don't have too much time and we need to give some uh, time for the questions and answers. So let's start the same way we started. Uh, and I apologize again, because I asked Vicky to, to, to jump uh, 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 Antonio, but let's start with Antonio this time. Antonio, please go ahead to wrap up your thoughts 
and uh, and then uh, we keep moving with the same order that that we had before in the first round. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, so I just like to wrap up um, with a few comments looking going forward into 2024. Because I think uh, that, um, especially after the referendum, there's going to be, a, and the, the international media is already preparing um, this discourse around Andres Manuel López Obrador and his possible successors. And we can see the articles in Washington Post and the New York Times um, attacking certain successors or planting these commentaries or attacking López Obrador himself on certain issues that are quite relevant um, for so-called leftists or whoever might consider himself or herself uh, a revolutionary, like for example, uh, green energies or environmentalism or the climate crisis. And I touch on this subject because earlier on I mentioned uh, the electricity reform and how this is a de facto nationalization of a crucial industry that is intended to um, lower electricity prices, but also control a very crucial industry for the uh, productive apparatus of the country. And the, the Lopez Obrador has not been painted as a particularly strong leader on uh, green issues. But we need to take into consideration that uh, the, all these, I mean, these uh, discursive parameters around environmentalism attacking Lopez Obrador um, come from, you know, this, uh, from the global north, north that has, uh, you know, exploited the global south for so long and uh, not allowed us to develop these uh, productive forces. And uh, when we talk about the elect electricity in Mexico, we're talking about uh, certain industries that are controlled, specifically renewable energies that are controlled, for example, by Spanish companies. Um, so I'm just warning comrades out there to look out for these uh, narratives that are going to be coming out, especially going forward into the recall referendum and um, touching on the recall referendum and ending on that as well. Uh, it's starting to become an issue about uh, concentration of power, but it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, it's actually just the deepening of democracy. It's amplifying the electoral mechanisms that we have at our disposal in order to exercise certain democratic rights as citizens, as Mexicans. And it's a very novel mechanism that I'm sure not many countries have. And if they do, they don't have the opportunities to implement them. And so I would just invite everyone to look out for the, this um, recall referendum that is going to be coming up possibly on April 10th, if we can get enough signatures uh, submitted to the National Electoral Authority in order to activate this uh, mechanism and uh, ratify the mandate of a government so that it can push forward with all the promises and the campaign promises and the mandate that the Mexican people uh, voted for in 2018. Uh, particularly because we come from 40 uninterrupted years of neoliberalism and a particularly uh, perverse form of neoliberalism, a militarized and sanguinary bloody force of neoliberalism here in Mexico. And being on the border of the United States is not easy. And in relation to other developments in Latin America, we can see that the Lopez Obrador administration, even though he has not been the strongest maybe in certain pet issues of the so-called left, uh, he has maintained a strong independent line when it comes to, if not anti-imperialism, because I, I truly don't believe that Mexico's government can be called anti-imperialist, but it can be called anti-interventionist. And I do believe there's a very important distinction and uh, that that should be recognized that uh, the Lopez Obrador government is an anti-interventionist government. It has very strong anti-interventionist uh, credentials and that that's going to be very important going forward with the uh, recent victories, for example, as we saw yesterday in Honduras and in the shaky victory that we saw in Peru that looks uh, more and more uncertain, which I hope is not so. Uh, but putting those issues forward, um, especially in foreign policy, because when we look at the candidates that are in play going into 2024, uh, three main candidates that we should be looking at uh, many of them attacked 
uh, by the international press. One of them, a very close uh, Clintonite, very close to the Democrat Party establishment in the U.S. that does not guarantee the continuity of a leftist tendency within this uh, political movement that is called the Fourth Transformation um, under Lopez Obrador. And another leftist candidate, the woman mayor of Mexico City, who is probably more left than the other two, uh, and I forgot to mention, the, the first one is Marcelo Ebrard, who is the current foreign minister. Um, and even though he has maintained a strong line against certain issues uh, regarding U.S. policy in Latin America, he's probably uh, in the center right of uh, Lopez Obrador, and he's only maintained this strong line under the very uh, stringent observation of the president. We have the Claudia Sheinbaum, also the mayor of Mexico City, who's probably uh, left le more left than even Lopez Obrador. And then we have Senator uh, Ricardo Monreal, who has very nefarious uh, connections with um, economic interests and probably organized crime interests. And uh, so those are the three main candidates that we should be looking out uh, into 2024 and keeping in your thoughts uh, these issues uh, that are going to be coming um, up next as uh, the contention for the presidential succession intensifies. And, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Nice listening to you. Now, Vicky. Yeah. So I think as we about as the liberal model has failed in Honduras, has built. And there's practical considerations that, for one thing, we don't know yet how many Congress people from the uh, Libre Alliance will be elected. And those are key to Ziomara being able to go forward with the project of a constituent assembly, the reform of the country. The other thing that's going to be key is the economics how to dismantle the project that has failed, but how to feed the people, how to, to move things forward while trying to move away from dependence and domination of the United States. So that's a key issue. And in order to do that, I think one of the big issues that Libre faces, as do all the parties, I think, we is their relationship with and integration with the social movements in Honduras, with the, with the people who have their own demands and their own dreams uh, that have to be met. And there has to be a in order the third, the last point, I think we'll stop at no, nothing to make sure that it continues to dominate in the region. So it's going to be really important that all of the audience, all of us in the North, especially, uh, stand up against that uh, so that the different kinds of maneuver maneuvers and layers of tactics that the US has shown that it can use to weaken or subvert a process like what we hope will be going forward in Honduras uh, does not succeed. Thank you, Vicky. Let's go now to Diego. If he's there, I don't see him, but uh, there he is. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Go ahead, compa. Try to wrap up because we are running out of time. Well, I don't have too much to wrap up about right now because I think we're still in, I think 2021 finished quite open-ended. And I think that's for all that's going on and it's a good thing. In the case of Venezuela, we're just going to, I guess, up until this point, I don't think we're going to have something too much unusual uh, other than, for example, the U.S. and his passive aggressive conduct being pushing the existence of Guaido, at least until, until December. That would be something to look after. It would, could be fun if, there's, if we can see an actual official U.S. demise of Juan Guaido, I think somewhere I, re I read earlier this year that he had until the, the end of this year to, to be valid for the US. I just don't remember exactly where, but anyway, I mean, he de facto already is, I mean, his last 
uh, image was that gift we saw about the symbol of the Venezuela and his own last press conference he had like this the, the the shield of Venezuela the symbol of the shield of Venezuela in the back and fell over and made a statement so it was pretty funny to see that even gravity says something about Guaido's destiny at least Antonio Wizar mentioned recall elections in Mexico, and I think that's another probable scenario that it's already going to start and people are going to say something about it uh, from some political forces. I don't know how meaningful it's going to be now, and I don't know what the shape is going to take in the, in the next months, but there are already initiatives led by other political dodgy people that are currently going on, I don't, I don't know how, with how much traction, I mean, I think people actually here, which is pretty usual also, it's more, more focused on finishing the year and the end year holidays than concerning and also try to make ends meet and find the money and, you know, to solve them more than concerns about what could happen in any other way. So I think that's going to also like, I don't know, ease up a bit, a bit I think, the Venezuelan domestic politics at least for a few weeks but that's a definitely an, a scenario that we have to look look after and also think about what they want to do focusing on the presidential election so that's why also a lot of uh, hostile actors against Venezuela have turned like in a way friendly like they would, could say uh, superficially of course about you know endorsing the elections and coming over and becoming official of service. That's all focused on what also could take shape in a few weeks, I think. And someone also talked about the validity right now of the Monroe Doctrine, you know, facing all these events. And also, I think you have to also focus a bit on global capitalism under this crazy COVID madness and the gap that's already widening between how this is being experienced in the North and how this is being experience from the south of the world. So I think that that also explains a bit the re-emergence of the, or the overt meddling of some European nations that yes, in a way challenges the original definition of the Monroe Doctrine. And I think as well, the UK is one very good example. Also, you can see, you can follow all the exposés that John McEvoy has recently done regarding Chile, Chile, Colombia, uh, in the past in Venezuela, right now Brazil coup also, to get an idea of how, actually how embedded they are. The same with Australia related, related to Operación Condor, or for example, how Germany, some German economic interests were actually pretty active in the early stages, in the mid stages of the Bolivian coup in 2019. So we're talking also about how people are concerned about the next economy and, the, and where the resources are going to come according, according to the definition of what they conceive is going to be the fourth industrial revolution and so on and how they're going to try to discipline society but how it's funny because how, where are those how it's going to be any different that idea for all these electronics and all this uh, AI uh, to us because they're going to use the same resources and the same uh, approach so how much it's going to change I don't know, I'm just giving also this like also open-ended reflections to finish this. And I'd like to thank you all because for your attention. Thank all you. the best. Thank you, Diego. Thank you. I jump Ramiro. Ramiro, <laughs> please. Definitely. Thank you so much. I think one thing that's impor important to recognize is the new strategy of hybrid warfare being used not only against Nicaragua, but all nations in the global south that are resisting imperialism. And one of these strategies is a term that I like to use a lot, which is called attacking the left from the left, branding anti-imperialist governments as reactionary, as conservative, as cracking down on Afro-Indigenous peoples. And this is a strategy that is being used very viciously against Nicaragua. A big part of the sanctions that have been imposed against Nicaragua are cutting beef imports from Nicaragua. And one of the claims they make is that the beef being grown in Nicaragua comes from a quote, conflict region. And a lot of this beef comes from the regions of Nicaragua on the Caribbean coast, 
where the Miskitu and the Mayagna peoples live, where they have national autonomy. Over 50% of Nicaragua's land is actually autonomous regions for Afro-Indigenous peoples, where they have control of their land. They work in collaboration with the Sandinista government, and they graze cattle and have great deals with the government where they export beef. The U.S. government is claiming that this is a conflict zone because there's an alleged genocide, and they use these terms. They're, they claim that there's a genocide of Afro-Indigenous peoples in Nicaragua, that the Sandinista government is killing and repressing activists, that they're violating human rights, and it's all nonsense. I have been to that region twice. I've been to Nicaragua twice this year. I interviewed people of that community. I've seen for myself there is no genocide taking place. I challenge anybody who's making that claim to provide any proof or evidence. Yet they're using this. There, there's this NGO out of California called the Oakland Institute. And their whole job, every other week, they have these reports. Indigenous repression in Nicaragua. Stop, you know, and they're appropriating the language of the left. Because obviously all of us here, it's not that we're against uh, indigenous liberation and sovereignty. We, we promote that. That's part of the revolutions of our people. But what they're doing, the new strategy of hybrid warfare, of hybrid imperialism, is appropriating the language, the imagery, the causes of our revolutions, subverting it and using it for empire. So I want to compel people to be aware of these new strategies, because these are exactly the tactics that are used to try to delegitimize our governments. I also saw somebody uh, mentioned uh, as one of the questions, something that comes up a lot is, Daniel Ortega has been in power way too long. Why can't he just give it up? Well, that's not for you to decide. That's up for the Nicaraguan people to decide. They like Comandante Daniel. They approve of him. And keep in mind that Daniel Ortega is the last living uh, Latin American president. Excuse me, my, my cat Sandino is kind of acting up. <laughs> uh, Daniel Ortega is the last living Latin American president who came to power in a guerrilla movement. He is somebody who has experience. He has seen so much throughout history. So the people of Nicaragua have a very different conception of what democracy is. And it's not this false bourgeois notion of democracy that we have in the West. That in the West, people think, okay, dem democracy is when every year, every four years, a new leader comes into power. That is democracy. And that's nonsense. Look at other countries. Look at Honduras, for example, which had every four years, right? We had the coup that took place against Celaya. They claimed that he was undemocratic because he just wanted to have a referendum on possibly changing the constitution. They took him out. They had a new right-wing puppet every four years. And that's not democracy. We see countries around the world that have right-wing puppet dictators for every four years. And that's not true democracy. So I think people in Nicaragua have a very different understanding. If we take the Leninist approach of democracy, socialist democracy, we understand that real democracy is exercised by the people, by the masses. And if the people want to elect Ortega as their leader, then so be it. And in Nicaragua, there's a slogan, el pueblo presidente, the people are the president. And that is exactly what we're seeing in Nicaragua. So uh, I just kind of wanted to wrap up on that point is that be very weary, be very careful of people who went, and especially people who went to Nicaragua in the 70s and the 80s, who have now betrayed the Sandinista revolution, who are writing books, who are writing as, I was once a Sandinista, now I'm against them because they're authoritarian, they're dictatorial. They used to be, they say the same thing, by the way, about Venezuela. They say, I support Chavez, I, I love Chavez, but Maduro, oh no, he's horrible. It doesn't work like that. So um, thank you so much uh, to everybody. And I just wanted to, to point that out. Thank you, Ramiro. Thank you. Now is your chance, Rodrigo. All right, I'm going to be quick. I just wanted to just get some points real quick. Uh, I can't talk about Chile and, and not talk about uh, the Mapuche struggle, right? And I think that it's very clear that in Chile, whether it's, uh, you know, Boric or Cast, whether it's the left or the right, what is going to be their response to the Mapuche people's uh, struggle? You know what I mean? I call it, in a rap song, I say this is Walmapu versus Walmart. You know what I mean? And it's literally the concept of indigenous communities uh, standing up against the multinational corporations that have stolen their indigenous land. When you look at the uprisings in Chile, when you look at the protests, um, 
you saw more images of Camilo Catrillanca, uh, a way chapter that was murdered in 2018 by the, by the Chilean police of Macarena Valdez, an environmentalist Mapuche young woman who was murdered as well. Um, more images of the Mapuche flag than the Chilena flag, more images of, of, of Catrillanca than even Allende or even of Victor Jara. And so I say that in that the Mapuche struggle to me is what I consider to be the forefront of struggle in Chile right now, uh, because it's it's literally a, 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 a 500 year battle against colonization that continues today. And that I think is very uh, is telling of what these governments represent. You know what I mean? That they haven't been able to give the, the Mapuche folks their land. So one of our biggest songs, Rebel Diaz, is which side are you on? And so I, I question who is loyal to capitalism? Who is loyal to neoliberalism? These are key questions. I think that more and more we're seeing groups that are, uh, are kind of you know you know not really clear about their loyalties or kind of uh you know playing both sides of the fence and so to that we say my view is that whoever becomes president i have a renuncia blank sign ready for whether it's renuncia cast or renuncia boardix i hope that we're saying renuncia boardix because at least uh, the material reality of folks will be better than fascism winning. I'm not in any way trying to say that we should allow fascism to win. But at the same time, as soon as Borix win, we're going to be saying renuncia Borix. You know what I'm saying? Because the fight for dignity is, is further than, than a candidate that, that to us represents the lesser of two evils. And so, so to what I see now in Chile that's going on is people are galvanizing to organize campaigns. We see this a lot. People are reactionary. We can't let fascism win. Let's organize all together for Bernie Sanders, all together for Biden, all together for Boris. And so I say we have to organize the people. Organize the people, don't organize campaigns. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that's key, is that we have to really go and build with the people. And the people that fought for two years at Plaza Dignidad were fighting for, their, their, their struggle was very clear. We want a life where we have dignity. And what does dignity mean? You know what I'm saying? A right to education, to work, to a dignified retirement, to transportation, the basic things and necessities that people need. And so I think that, you know, that, that's where we stand. I think uh, politically, it's always gonna be with the people, um, but at the same time, we, you know, this is a, a very important uh, victory that needs to be had against fascism in Chile. And from there, we'll, we'll hold folks accountable. But I think that like, like I said, again, organize people, not campaigns. Thank you, Rodrigo, thank you. Nice to listen all of you guys, really. For sure, respect. Uh, I apologize for for the to the to the guests for the long time we have taken, but I enjoying it. Uh, 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 I'm gonna try to wrap it up the Argentina issue uh, as fast as I can, and to jump with Sahili to try to 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 do a few questions and answers for those ones that want to remain with us. I respect if you don't have time for that. But I believe that it's important to keep the, the, the conversation. Uh, and in the case of Argentina, what I just wanted to add is that, I mean, as I told you, I mean, we are still, we still need to see what is going to happen because the new, uh, the new uh, seats uh, are going to start in a few weeks. So the, the, the candidates that were voted are not already, are not yet in the, in the, in the Congress. So, so we need to see what happened. And I believe that, that, that part of the discussion is being kept as away from the media because I, tr I was trying to, you know, to look for information about, about possible alliances and things like that. And I didn't find too many, you know, sources talking in depth about that. So I believe that in December, in January, we're going to start seeing those discussions in the Argentinian Congress about, you know, those possible alliances that might keep uh, Alberto Fernandez government running at least for the next two years and maybe you know given a strength and that's something that I forgot to mention which is that in these elections is regarding that that the, the opposition got more votes uh, the the Kirchnerismo found it uh, as a victory because they were expecting worse because the, the primary elections that were held a couple of months before the, the real elections, I mean, uh, 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 show that the results were going to be worse, but in reality, they managed to make them less dramatic in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the loss of seats in the Senate and in the deputies chamber. So that's what happened. That's what I believe is going to happen in Argentina. But the case of Argentina is one of those cases that that 
make me think about, you know, the, this discussion on how to move beyond left, uh, pink tide, however you want to call it, uh, you know, uh, governments in the region and right wing governments, you know, alternating in, in, in power one time and then the other. And, 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 and I believe that Argentina is one of those good examples of that. I mean, Argentina has been passing through Macri, through, 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 the, through Cristina, and then now maybe another right winger is going to win. I hope that that doesn't happen. But uh, when we presented the idea of this panel, we wanted to raise, I mean, uh, to, uh, we want you to start thinking on how to move beyond that. I mean, uh, and the same thing might happen in other countries. I mean, is, I mean, how to get beyond that we are in the middle of, I mean, we circumstantially have a progressive government in our countries and how to move beyond that and, you know, do the jump to a more socialist, you know, uh, system, a system uh, more capable of advancing the real necessities of the people and 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 getting us rid of those misconceptions of the bourgeois democracy that let us believe that that's the way it should be and that uh, uh, for example in the US uh, you know uh, that, that phenomena in the US keep millions of US citizens uh, trapped into this stupid dichotomy between Democrats and Republicans uh, and, 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 and what I wanted to, to highlight is like, we need to find ways to push towards something more in depth, something, a real change that, and that also, also applied to Venezuela. I mean, some people talk about Venezuela being a socialist, that we need to move way faster towards socialism or, or, or maybe Nicaragua or other countries of the region. And, and I recognize that we are not perfectly, you know, we are, we are not a socialist country, but at least we have advanced a little bit, but we need to do way more. And the question is how we'll be able to do that. I mean, we need the people to push the, the, the governments to organize as, uh, as, uh, as Rodrigo was saying and, and other panelists. So, so that's what I wanted to say. I'm gonna invite uh, Sahili to join us uh, again and to to help us with the questions and answers. Sahili, if you can. Hi, I'm back here. Yeah. Okay, so I think we'll start with I think uh, Ramiro on uh, Nicaragua. There are a few questions. There is something from Nino. I see. Uh, he says, I believe that the election in Venezuela destroys important myths about Chavismo. Oh, no, he is. Okay, I, I'll go to that a bit later. I will start with this question, which I find interesting. It's also for Ramiro himself. Anyway, so what this person is saying is that there is, a, like in general, the church is a, a repressive force, not just in Latin America, it's everywhere. Religion actually has been used by those in power as a repressive force. However, there is some relation with Sandinismo and the church, especially thinking of liberation theology. Whereas there are other factions of the church that are against Sandinismo. We have seen them organizing, especially in this election, trying to discredit and everything. So the question that is, how does this relation between Sandinismo and the church affect the gender equality on the ground in Nicaragua. I can talk about other things also, not just gender equality. I, I think that's a great question. I think it's something that is very important to understanding socialism with Nicaraguan characteristics. One thing that I think is important to mention is that, first of all, whenever we're talking about feminism, gender equality, the people's understanding of gender equality, feminism, in the global south, especially Nicaragua, is much different from the bourgeois notions in the global north and the first world, where in Nicaragua, proletarian feminism is deeply connected to the land, deeply connected to access to resources, to nature, to farming. I visited numerous farming communities that were run exclusively by women, and many of them are 
Catholic, many of them are Christian, many of them consider themselves both socialist and Catholic. And I think to understand religion in Nicaragua is very complex. It's not one or the other. During the 2018 coup attempt in Nicaragua, there was a sector of the Catholic Church officially in Nicaragua that sided with the opposition against President Daniel Ortega. However, the grassroots movement of parishioners in Nicaragua also sided with Daniel Ortega and the roots of the Frente Sandinista are fundamentally a synthesis, a syncretism of Marxism, Leninism, Sandinismo, but also liberation theology. Because one of the fundamental concepts of Christianity that is applied to Sandinismo is that it is a sin to make profit from nothing, to create something out of nothing, usury, which is condemned officially in the Bible. Right. And this is something that Lenin talks about when talking about finance capital, the final stage of capitalism, which is imperialism, where you have these banking elites who are doing money magic and are creating so-called value out of nothing by just crunching numbers in an office in, the, in the, the World Bank or the IMF. And Daniel Ortega has been extremely opposed to the IMF and the World Bank. In fact, it was one of the main reasons why the 2018 coup attempt was launched against him. So within the economics and the banking institutions of Nicaragua, these sorts of speculation and usury and debt, these sorts of financial trappings are seen as not only illegal, but sinful and bad and harmful to Nicaragua as part of Sandinismo. I think one of the interesting developments in Latin America overall has been the rise of evangelical churches Historically, in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Roman Catholic Church has played a twofold role. There have been obviously re repressive and reactionary forces of the Roman Catholic Church in Latin America. That's not to be denied by any chance, but we can't deny that the overwhelming majority of the people in the Sandinista Revolution themselves were progressive Catholics, were priests, were parishioners, people who melded these ideas of socialism and Catholicism together. Now, in the 80s, with the rise of the Contras, the rise of Reagan and the evangelical right, you have these right-wing evangelical pro-Israel Zionist churches popping up all over Nicaragua, Central America, in Guatemala, in Honduras, El Salvador, and they have a lot of power. And this is one of the ways that both the United States and Israel have been spreading their influence across the region. We saw this happen as well in Bolivia, where Janine Añez and the right-wing Bolivian fascists described indigenous peoples as satanic, as polytheist, as these evil beings. And we're seeing the same thing from the evangelical forces in Nicaragua, even here in Los Angeles, where I'm speaking to you from now, it's interesting that one of the organizers of the March for Nicaragua and Opposition rally was an evangelical church in Los Angeles. So the evangelical Zionist movement in Nicaragua and across Latin America is something that we should all keep our eyes out on because it's a way of spreading pro-Israel, pro-U.S. propaganda that deems anyone who wants to help the poor, that deems indigenous peoples as evil, that sees socialism as evil. And all of this has roots from the 1950s and the 60s, 60s going back to Sigmund Rhee in South Korea, to the Moonies who were brutal, the anti-communist league who were in collusion with the state of Israel. So I think that Overall, the Catholic Church, I would say, is the Catholic institution itself, the, official, the, the high officials in Nicaragua tend to be more opposition-leaning. The base of Catholic and Christian people overwhelmingly support Daniel, and I think that's a good thing. I don't think for the church bureaucracy to be in collusion with the government is, I don't think that's a good thing. The, the base of the Catholic Church in Nicaragua supports Daniel. But we see this rising threat from the evangelicals who are bringing this pro-US, pro-Israel message, this anti-socialist message to the region. And I think that's a development that we all have to keep in mind. But yes, the people of Nicaragua blend not just Catholicism and socialism, but also indigenous thought. Also, 
the ideas of the Mayagna, the, the Miskitu, the Nahual people, the trees of life all over Managua have a, a deep indigenous history. So I would say that the socialism of Nicaragua is a synthesis of indigenous religion, of Catholic religion, of socialism, of Sandinismo, of Marxism, Leninism, of Bolivarianism, of so many things. And I think that's what makes it so beautiful and unique. Thanks a lot, Ramiro, for the reply. That's good. Okay, so now Nino wants some comments from either from Diego or for Jesus or both about this thing. He made this comment. I believe that the election in Venezuela destroys important myths that Chavismo movement is decreasing, that the opposition is strong, <coughs> and that there is no pluralism in Venezuela, democracy, etc. And minimize the relevance of low turnout because the election happened in the middle of a two-front war, the hybrid war that Ramiro mentioned, and also the pandemic. So, like, what is your comment on that, that uh, turnout was a little more than 40% and that uh, there is all this idea that there is depoliticization in Venezuela? Well, Actually, I mentioned it a bit uh, at the start of the first deliberation because, yes, I mean, there's, you can't frame, you can't think about these elections without can, taking into consideration such disruptive elements of daily life, such as, well, the, uni uh, the unilateral coercitive uh, uh, measures in this case, in, uh, because, that also always was always meant to bring a toll and to depoliticize people because of also the, because of all the problems of of, lively, of livelihood. And this result, first, it's a regional election. Usually, there, I mean, this behavior. It's if you compare it to previous elections, it's not so. It's even better than some years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, it was pretty bad, for example. The, uh, the overall participation on, the, on those elections and the results. So I think to actually analyze these kind of scenarios, it's even more fluid than you could expect. The thing is that there's, yes, there is also, because that's something that Nino also addressed, there's this wishful thinking about saying that... Uh, that's what's going on right now. Like if there's a Chav declining Chavismo and there's like this surge in opposition, which is actually not correct, especially because there's a different, I mean, you, you don't have one opposition and that's also that's something that was clearly stated in the electoral results. And those oppositions that are now uh, at the front are actually not even uh, too agreeable among themselves. So it's not an easy, so it's not an easy, an easy conclusion. Other, Regardless of yes, of a smaller or reduced participation in in the elections in general, but still under this framework and still under uh, the other elements that also was mentioned by Nino of, of hybrid warfare in this case, as in the diplomatic elements, the, the security elements the mix of the basic formula of, of hybrid warfare between you know color revolution plus unconventional warfare in a, in a moment that the color revolution part is actually just uh, gone bust and you have also only the one kind of resources but even then there's also an, there's even a higher exhaustion of that kind of situation of that kind of drive of that kind of of uh, Sorry. of meddling i think uh, of forcing the situation in venezuela so if you see it through that lens, you can also highlight the resistance in, that, in this case, Chavista resistance and the national resistance in general, I think, because there's a sense after why though there, there was also an awareness of, let's call it nationalism outside of the Chavismo framework that also reacted to what, uh, how far these groups of the opposition were, were willing to go. So I think that's also important, also a healthy part of the Venezuelan process and how we could sort it out ourselves regardless of, of uh, political positions, but casting away the violence that you tried to impose for so long. Yes, I would like to add that I, I'm, I'm agree, I agree with, with, with Diego in terms of, I mean, we cannot diminish the victory 
the Chavismo had in these last regional elections. I mean, it's, it's an absolute fact that the, the Venezuela map, uh, if you see it in terms of the, the winners of each governorship in Venezuela, is red. I mean, uh, I mean, well, you know, the, the culpa, it's just one thing, but I also, I mean, you, you, we didn't talk about just one thing. I'm sorry to interrupt you and to add this, but I think it's also important to talk about that there's also current assessments on why, for example, Chavismo was defeated, de defeated in some of the states or how it had a narrower outcome of what ex it is expected. This is something that's not out of the conversation right now in Chavista circles and in politics in general. That's also part that's being addressed that will also give further information and, would all, and that also taught us in general as Chavistas a lesson in this case. And also I think a final uh, point there is that basically there's a pretty conscious vote and the message it could send or the lack of vote in this case because elections are here not, are not mandatory uh, in this kind of scenario, especially on the regional context, which is actually uh, particular in all senses, in according to each and every state and municipality. Sorry. That's true. Don't go, don't go ahead. Go ahead. That's true. But what I wanted to highlight is that, I mean, you cannot deny that Chavismo won, PSUV won, like 21 uh, out of 24 states, including the capital district. That's a fact. I mean, maybe 20, because right now it's in dispute uh, the, the state of Varinas, but uh, CNA highlights that that that, even, that the numbers that they gave uh, at the beginning are the ones that are, you know, saying that the PSUV even won in that, that is but they, they, is, they called the there's a there's a court the decision that came today, out right now yes yes today the supreme court of venezuela called for a stop of the recon because of the right winger requested that to the to the supreme another court. candidate but, but 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 they already called for an for a next election on, on january ah i didn't see that yeah, recently this is this is breaking news <laughs> no kidding no kidding i was yes. thinking that that so, was my vn scenario and that happened okay i believe that that yeah you have better. to bear in mind there's there's also a crazy context here because the guy that actually introduced this uh, appeal appeal to the uh, to the Supreme court it was actually another candidate that actually was the former lawyer of the one of the candidates in dispute so it's even crazier than you expect so that's how fluid some things are here yes Yes, but anyway, taking that into consideration, I mean, the, the map for governors is red with a few exceptions. And, and when you talk about uh, uh, majors, I, we are talking about uh, out of 335 majors that we have in Venezuela, Chavismo won uh, 210, if I don't recall, uh, if I recall well. So we are talking that Chavismo had like, uh, like what, what is that? Uh, like, like, like 70% or something like that of all the major cities in the city. That says something. But also I believe that uh, those uh, analysis about, you know, counting the votes and, uh, and adding all the opposition together, even including the, 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 the communists in, uh, within the opposition, uh, is, a, is a good analysis that needs to be done in order to to avoid uh, over optimism among Chavista forces, uh, among PSUV leadership. So also that bear analysis... in mind that, uh -huh. that, the, 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 that the Communist Party has the lowest outcome in, in, in this history That's true. inside Chavista, That's which true. also tells a lesson about that left. It's like 1.6% or something. I was reading yes. somewhere. Yes. And they 200,000 votes. Yes, and I, I believe that they used to get between four and six percent in most of the elections, if you ask me. So yes, but, but anyways, I mean uh, that analysis of you know putting all the votes of the opposition and you know comparing those votes with the Chavista vote is a good analysis also because it's you know it of course is almost a, a lie to think that the opposition is going to be able to unite themselves. At least under current circumstances, but the reality is that that happened before. But right now, it's, very, it's not very easy to think that the Venezuelan opposition is going to unite. But the exercise is good, in my opinion, you know, that kind of statistical exercises that are right now in the middle of the political debate among Chavistas here in Venezuela. 
uh, uh, I believe that it's important in order to especially prepare the leadership of the PSUV for next battles in order to try to assess the, the, the you know, the, the things that were not done right in the campaign or during the, you know, terms of many governors or mayors that we know that uh, 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 some of them are not perfect, but, you know, in that sense, I believe that the, the, that kind of debate, that kind of an analysis, and that's democracy, and I, I, I love it because I believe that it's, it's good to have that kind of analysis in order to move on. Sorry, Sahili, for speaking too long. No, it's okay. So, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, Nino is, I think, of the same mind as Diego saying that it's impossible for the opposition to unite anywhere, not just in Venezuela, but anywhere in the world. That's what he thinks. And thank you, Nino, for the question and the comments, and of course, all of you. Rodrigo, now, there is, something. I, I want to ask uh, no? uh, Rodrigo. Okay, okay. I okay, want to, I, the next question was for Rodrigo. Where did he go? Okay, anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> No, no, the next question is for you. And I think that uh, looking at the question, I think that you should explain a bit about the Apruevo Dignidad coalition because this, uh, whoever asked this was thinking, saying that uh, Daniel Hardway was leading in the polls before the primaries. And then there was like Boric won the primaries of, of Apruevo Dignidad. So what Apruevo Dignidad really was, a coalition and also, I would like to add a bit to it that recently, the entirety of Apruevo Dignidad, including the part that Hardware leads, let's say, it condemned Nicaraguan elections and refused to recognize Daniel Ortega's victory. So if you would make a comment on all of these things, that what Apruevo Dignidad is and why this sort of thing exists within like the contradictions within the left or pink side, whatever you may call it. I mean, yeah, the Apruebo Dignidad Coalition um, is, uh, you know, they're, they're the progressives. They're like, I would compare them to like the Bernie Sanders. You know what I mean? They're like the Bernie Sanders type, uh, you know. And so what, what's, what's crazy is that, I'll give you an example. They're, what I said earlier, they call themselves Apruebo Dignidad. You know what I'm saying? But Boric, he tried to go to the Plaza Dignidad in the middle of the rebellion and got kicked out, you know what I'm saying? And so I think it's very, it's, it's very similar to what you see happen over here in which you have the media play, you know, the criminalization of the protester. They do the good protester versus bad protester, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, narrative, which is, it's copy and paste imperialism. Like in, in Chile, they have a way, they say it in Spanish, esa no es la forma. Like that's not the way you do it, you know? And so, Gabriel Boric comes from the student movement. You know what I mean? He's young. He's 35 years old. He was a student leader. You know what I mean? But the reality is that all those student leaders, like many young leaders here, were co-opted. The minute they became politicians and joined the Concertación, they were co-opted. Boric, I'm not surprised that the Apremo, that the Apremo coalition would not recognize the 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 you know, the, the Nicaraguan uh, presidency, the Sandinistas. You know what I'm saying? I'm not surprised at all because they were clear. I want to share something. Gabriel Boric on November 15th, it was the biggest backstabbing you could have done to the social movement. He went on his own. He broke with his party line and agreed and one is, was like one of the main votes to agree to this peace treaty. In Chile today, there's 2,500 political prisoners, los presos de la revuelta, that are behind bars. You don't see no, I would love to see the energy to elect this neoliberal dude to free the presos of the revuelta, to, to really put that energy back out into the streets. But that November 15th peace treaty, it took the air, you know what I'm saying? It took the air out of, out of, that, out of that struggle. They had Piñera on the ropes. They was ready for a knockout, you know what I'm saying? And so I, I think that, you know, that the Prevo, I'll, I'll share something. The type of capitalism that they're promoting is very similar to this capitalist wave that we're seeing. We have to understand capitalism is a crisis. It's trying to figure out how to reinvent itself to keep surviving in the world that we have today. Last year, during the George Floyd uprisings, and I bring up the U.S. because, you know, I, 
believe it or not, Suko Nante Marcos, when I was 16 years old, I went to Chiapas and he told me himself with his own words, he said, the war against U.S. imperialism is gonna, not going to be won here in Chiapas. It's going to be won on the streets of the United States. You know? And so I say that, I say that in the essence that let's look at the way capitalism is moving here. Last year, after the, globe, the George Floyd protests, it was crazy. All in one day, Apple, Nike, you know what I'm saying? Tesla, they all put out Black Lives Matter. On the NBA courts, it said Black Lives Matter. But the new, uh, you know, the new wave, wave of capitalism that we're living is a capitalism like the Apruebo Nacional that's willing to be ecological, that's willing to be inclusive, that's willing to say, hey, for sure, Mapuches, you want to be recognized? Let's have one of your you know, community members write the, 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 the convention. We'll, we'll, we'll see to that. And, and you see it happening. You know, when Biden won, they used the whole wave as Kamala Harris, the cop, right? The cop, uh, the former cop, because she was a black woman. Since, that, since the victory of the election, that woman's been hiding. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I think that we have to be clear. We have to be clear uh, on, on who the people that we're dealing with in Chile are. And so, yeah, that, that's really, it's not surprising that they wouldn't uh, recognize uh, Ortega. Not at all. That's who they are. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Raul Rodrigo. That was uh, enlightening. Now the next question is about Mexico and it's very complicated. Okay, I will try to cover all of it together. There are two questions actually. So I will try to we'll punch them together and ask you, Antonio. It's a question for Antonio. Anyway, so when since we are talking about uh, Nicaragua and the elections in Nicaragua, mm, there, there has been some unfortunate comments on the elections and Sandinismo, FSL and victory in everything from Mexico, coming from the government of Mexico. And also at the same time, there is this coalition, since we are on the subject of coalition, there is this coalition in Mexico itself, the right wing coalition that you already mentioned, but I would like you to amplify a bit on that subject of pre pan PRZ and other parties forming this coalition and especially US money being involved in it. So on the one hand, AMLO has condemned repeatedly the OS interventionism everywhere, not only in Mexico, in Bolivia and everywhere else. And at the same time, he made these comments about uh, like problematic comments, not just he, but in general, the government more like, and of course, Ebrard, that these problematic comments, especially regarding Nicaragua, so what is like what is this situation? Why does this exist and what does it mean? Like, will there be any sort of coup attempt or even coup, soft coup attempt in Mexico? Uh, unmute yourself if you can. Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, there were some unfortunate comments by just in general by the government of Mexico, not just AMLO, as was reported by the press, um, about evitar uh, to reject repression and to guarantee liberties in Nicaragua. Um, that it's a very lukewarm response by AMLO, and he he also conditioned it by condemning intervention in other countries' foreign affairs. Um, so it's 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 this uh, tension within the the Mexican government of maintaining a line against intervention, but also being against a rock and a hard place when it comes to media narratives um, about Latin America, and in particular Nicaragua the Nicaraguan elections in Mexican media were very much maligned and they were painted as a fraudulent months before they even happened. Um, uh, Comandante Daniel Ortega was um, maligned as a dictator. The elections were painted as fraudulent. And so in this context, in this media conditioning, uh, it, it was very hard to formulate a, a coherent and firm response against um, intervention and for the free self-determination of the Nicaraguan people. And it's especially sad uh, coming from Mexico and speaking for myself uh, to, to hear these comments because uh, we might remember that Mexico was one of the few governments that supported Sandino and even gave him refuge in the 1920s 
Mexico actually provided ammunition and ships uh, when Sandino was uh, fighting U.S. Marines in Nicaragua in 1925-26. And in fact, the closest time that Mexico was um, at the brink of war with the United States after 1848, when uh, half of our territory was stolen by Mexico, was in fact in uh, 1925 and 1926, in the winter of those years, between, um, I believe, uh, December and January of those years, because uh, Mexico was supporting Sandino and was uh, providing arms and ammunition um, to fight against uh, American, U.S. American imperialism in Central America. Uh, so that, that was the closest that we ever came to war with the U.S. after the 1848. And so it's very unfortunate to have this history of a very deep friendship with the Nicaraguan people and um, the Sandinista movement and then have these comments um, in order to play into a media uh, narrative that has been built about um, our, well, Central America, Nicaragua in particular. Uh, this sort of happened around the case of Bolivia, but in that case, we had much stronger uh, leftist response um, against uh, the immediate conditioning um, in, in that sense. And Nicaragua was just, it was very, <laughs> very like the full force of the media was just uh, against um, the Nicaraguan election and um, so it was AMLO responding to media pressure it was AMLO um, in a sense being pragmatic and that, that might be cowardly in in a sense uh, but again he also conditioned and conditioned uh, his qualification with um, that the Mexico must respond uh, respect non-interference um, I do believe that um, with the recall referendum and the strengthening of the mandate of Lopez Obrador, that he will be able to take stronger positions against uh, the U.S. intervention in the future. And uh, yeah, be, be, being between a rock and a hard place, as I'm saying. And touching on the issue of the opposition alliance, um, the coalition of the PRI, PAN and PRD, like the soft left, and then the uh, neoliberal right wing. Um, they, 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 were, um, they coalesced around multimillionaire Claudio X. Gonzalez, who, as you mentioned, through uh, the civil association Mexicans against corruption, again, weaponizing this um, corruption, this term corruption or the fight against corruption like it was done in Brazil um, in the hybrid war against the um, Workers' Party there. Um, well, this, uh, this multimillionaire receives foreign funding through this association uh, from the U.S. and uh, he's attacking, or they're attacking the opposition, Lopez Obrador, uh, through what is actually his strongest, um, his strongest point, his strongest policy position, which is anti-corruption. Uh, so far, it has not worked. Uh, the, the, the president maintains a very strong and high credibility. And uh, the, we'll see this again, going back to the recall referendum, we'll see probably his mandate being ratified. And um, Marcelo Ebrard, I do believe that had a lot to do with uh, the position that Mexico had on, the unfortunate position that Mexico had on Nicaragua. And again, it's mostly due to the, the media pressure um, because in other cases, uh, even probably in, in crises more um, profound than the Nicaraguan situation, like Bolivia and Venezuela, Mexico has had a more respectable position. Um, and so I, I do think that this was just a blunder, well, a foreign policy blunder, but also responding to a lot of the media pressure that um, is ramping up as we go into the recall referendum of 2022, where the opposition will probably be soundly defeated and then AMLO's mandate will be strengthened. Thank you. Oh. No, thanks for the explanation. And uh, I, I have one of these questions on, okay, on Honduras. So uh, it will be for Vicky Cervantes, I believe. So the thing is, uh, of course, you mentioned the problems that Xiomara Castro will now face as she becomes the president. So the, the question is, it seems very similar to the situation in Peru where there was a lot of hope generated 
when Pedro Castillo won. But now the situation in Peru is like a disaster, especially with the government changing ministers every time. And then also this question of vacancy coming up in the Congress. So there was already a lot of problem in Peru with the coalition and then not winning enough seats, like a majority in the parliament. I don't know what is the situation. I don't think there is any final count on the parliamentary election in Honduras also, because there were a lot of elections going on, not just the presidential election. So how it will, I mean, what will be the situation that Xiomara Castro will face and how the results of the regional and parliamentary elections affect this her decisions that she may take in future. Uh, if you could <coughs> unmute yourself, it's a question for Vicky Cervantes, and I think I think she is frozen or so. Can you hear me? Please unmute, uh, unmute yourself. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh I believe that Vicky might be having internet issues because she has been coming up and down. But it's a nice question. I believe yeah, that yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about the question, trying to give her a chance to reconnect if she, if she can. Yes, yes, uh, that, would be, that would be nice. Or we could also ask that, also we could uh, ask uh, Ramiro. Med, med, exactly, maybe all of the, the, Ramiro that is familiar to, to Central America also. It's his country as well. Input. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think Pre Presidenta Xiomara Castro Celaya has a lot of problems that she's facing. First of all, Honduras right now has, is the second poorest country in Latin America and the Caribbean after Haiti a country that has been completely devastated by neoliberal economics. In Honduras, there is no public infrastructure. Everything has been privatized, highways, healthcare, education, housing. So one of the big challenges is creating and lifting the national infrastructure of the country. One of the biggest contradictions that came up following the Soviet Union and the, the Russian Revolution, as well as the People's Republic of China, was making the transition from feudalism to socialism without this intermediary stage of capitalism. And Honduras is in many ways a very semi-feudal country. Honduras is not like Argentina, it's not like Chile or Mexico or Colombia or even Venezuela that has already gone through this process of capitalist development. Most of the country is rural, most of the country is extremely underdeveloped, illiteracy is through the roof. In many ways, Honduras has not changed much since the early 1900s, the 1800s. So she's going to face the challenge of developing the national means of production, creating an electrical company, creating a, a public transportation, even sanitation. The last time I was in Honduras, 2019, one of the biggest problems is that there is no public sanitation company or program. So people, what they do is they, they burn garbage in their yards. They're forced to burn garbage. Right. And a lot of times people from the West will go to some somewhere like Haiti or Honduras and say, why is there always so much garbage? This is actually the same in, in Bangladesh, by the way. I went to Bangladesh in 20, uh, one of the 2013, 2014. Very similar economic model, neoliberalism. There is no centralized state to bring services to the people. So the people are forced to take care of matters like sanitation on their own. So you'll see people burning garbage in their yards. And it's not because there's some backward global South countries because the free market, right? Neoliberal, there is no state planning to take care of things like sanitation and clean water. So these are very much the problems that she's going to face that are some of the early on problems of building socialism in a country, bringing the literacy rate of hospitals, schools. And one of the challenges related to that is having to form temporary alliances with the national comprador bourgeoisie, which up to now has allied itself with US imperialism. One of the biggest industries of Honduras is textiles, Fruit of the Loom, Hanes. I guarantee you that if you go to your closet now, one of your shirts or pants was probably made in Honduras because 
It is one of the countries that has a large sweatshop labor uh, force where so many of the products that we wear and produce and, and, and have in the, in the U.S. are from Honduras. So a lot of the problems that she's going to face are not only building up a means of production in the country, starting from zero, but also finding a way to avoid corruption and transparency. Because whenever you have these temporary alliances with people who aren't even necessarily political or who aren't socialists or don't have the interests of the people, there can be corruption, unfortunately. So that's one problem. Another problem, I think, that's not so much a problem per se, but I think it's something that the Libre Party is definitely going to be taking up is the issue of land rights. In Honduras, Afro-Indigenous communities have been struggling to defend their lands for years, especially against what are called the CEDES, Z-E-D-E-S, the free trade zones, which are these horrible, I mean, if you ever watched this show called Black Mirror, it's, it's like the epitome of that, a sci-fi novel where a corporation runs a, an entire area like a plantation, like a United Fruit Company. They have their own laws, their own currency, their own home. You know, they, it's, it's disgusting. And that's one of the projects that the right-wing National Party has been imposing. She has spoken out against CEDES and has uh, vowed to rebuke them. So land rights for Afro-Indigenous people, the Garifuna people and the Northern Coast, giving that land back to the Garifuna people. That land currently, by the way, one of the biggest elements of imperialism that's very often uh, not mentioned is Canada. Canada plays a big role in imperialism in Honduras. The Garifuna lands, the Caribida company based in Canada that has been developing tourism, making the island of Roatan into a, a cryptocurrency haven like they're doing with Puerto Rico. And also in the southwest of the country in the Lenca territory where Berta Cáceres is from, a lot of Canadian mining companies are there building hydroelectric dams as well. So I think the land question is going to be huge for Xiomara. And I think also the building up the infrastructure. We're talking about a very impoverished country. I think people really have to understand just how poor Honduras is because of capitalism and building up the means of production without the free market will definitely be a challenge, but it's not impossible. You know, Nicaragua is doing it right now, Bolivia which was once the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti, under Evo Morales before the coup had the fastest growing economy, fastest growing GDP in 2019. So it's 100% possible. And I think Xiomara is going to definitely be looking at China, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, looking at what Cuba and Venezuela and Bolivia have been doing and Nicaragua. And I think that this is really going to be the model moving forward. Okay, thanks, Ramiro. If uh, Vicky's problem with internet has got solved, I would like you to comment on this thing also, that what are the problems that Xiomara Castro will face as she becomes the president, not just the problems of infrastructure that Ramiro was mentioning, no. but also the fact that how the composition of the parliament uh, and also uh, the results of the local elections will affect her decision and also the coalition that she has with uh, the, I mean, center right parties, let's say. Hey, real quick, I'm sorry. I, I got to run. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for, for having us. And, you know, I just want to say peace. And uh, I appreciate everybody's intervention. I learned a lot from hearing you guys today. Thank you. Peace. Well, I, I don't know if my Wi-Fi is better or not. It seems to be just going in and out like crazy. But I, I uh, and I really, I think Ramiro hit all of that uh, like a nail on the head. Um, the other thing that the more practical or like the, the kind of nuts and bolts of electoral victories is that uh, Libre is necessarily sweep the Congress just because it sweeps the presidency. And so the, they need a majority with the coalition. They need a solid, dependable majority uh, of people who will support the program and the plan of government, including con constituent assembly, all of the things that need to be done and are, are desperate to be done. And that we don't know yet how that is going to shake out. Even the National Party, which uh, 
has lost, or I should say even the Liberal Party, which only ended up with like 10% of the vote, and that's one of the old traditional uh, capitalist parties, even they, with that, low ter- with that low percent, are still going to maintain a certain number of their congressional representatives and mayors. So it's unclear right now how the numbers are going to shake out, but one of the big challenges for and for the refounding of does Libre, does the movement have in the Congress? Because they're, while just like in all democracies, the president has certain discretionary powers and certain things they can do through decree, it almost all Significant things require being able to get a room. That is going to, that's going to be a big challenge. It also means that she's going to have to do a certain amount of negotiating and maneuvering inside the Congress with some forces that are not that friendly to the project at all, uh, but might be able to hold towards certain specific things. I, I, I hope I understood the question correctly in that. Yes, yes, of course, it was, it was exactly what was asked of you. Thank you for the response, not just for you, but for everyone. Uh, I think that is the end of the question and answer session, and I'd like Jesus to conclude now. And just before that, if anyone else wishes to make a comment, any one of the panelists, please do. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sahili, and thank you, all you panelists and guests that are still following us. I know that has been a long a long debate, but I really believe that it's very important to have it. This kind of debate, especially from us, most of us in the South, to tell the people in the North what is really happening here. Because most of the time you hear those specialists and analysts and everyone you know in the in the North talking about what happened in our country, they, and they don't most of the time don't have a clue. Or any, if they have the clue, uh, they are just you know pushing interests of corporations of you know capitalism, the bourgeoisie, the oligarchy. So so in that sense, I'm pretty happy with all the information we have been providing to people out there. And I'm happy that you join us. And I will just ask you to help us, you know, share the, the information uh, about this event widely after we have the video online and, you know, in Facebook and that kind of places. And thank you again.